Good evening. I want to welcome you to Open Bible. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, I am really excited that we can take time together tonight. It's important to me, and I trust that it's important to you because you're here, that we can take time to talk and think about Jesus and his sacrifice and all that he did to save us. Hallelujah. Today we celebrate Good Friday. It's good for us because it was not so good for him. He was willing to take on all of our sin to what the Bible says, become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. Praise be to Jesus. Hopefully on the way in, you noticed that we are going to receive communion tonight, and you picked up the elements. If you didn't, don't worry. Uh, In just a moment, we're going to pray, and we're going to stand and sing some songs. And while we're doing that, if you don't have your elements, you can slip out and grab those. Hang on to them. We will receive them together uh, at the end of service tonight. So with that, let's go ahead and stand. Would you grab somebody's hand that's right around you if you feel comfortable doing that? We're just going to link up and pray. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for this wonderful night that we can gather and we can think about, we can meditate, we can look at the Word and see exactly what you were willing to do for us because of your great love. Lord, you're the reason that that we're here. You're the reason that we're alive. You are the reason. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for this time, Lord God. May your Holy Spirit minister mightily to us and press upon our hearts what you've done for us that we might carry that with us wherever we go and to always give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's worship together.
Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me thank you for your wounds tonight. We thank you for all that you were willing to suffer for us, that we were constantly on your mind. Lord, you knew the sacrifice, the only one that could save us, and you offered it through your body and your blood. Lord, and we cherish it and we celebrate you tonight. Lord, draw us close to you now as we think about all that you've done for us, and may you receive all the glory, all our love, and all our honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. While we turned away from him, he turned his heart toward us. While we chased after selfish desires, he chased after us. While we made excuses for our misguided choices, pursuing an elusive sense of fulfillment, he emptied himself to take the form of a servant. This unthinkable inequity our Creator clothed in flesh and weakness for the sake of those clothed in iniquity. While we were lost and alone, He became a path for us. While we embraced the comfort of falsehood, He embraced us and showed us truth. While we were eclipsed in shadow, our spirits broken and dying, He became life and light to all. Our Shepherd, our teacher, our savior and king. And when it seemed the world had given up, he gave up everything. At just the right time, when we were powerless, he displayed his power and purpose. While we stood accused, he accepted the accusation. He endured humiliation and the untold suffering of crucifixion. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we deserved it, far from it, but because there has never been a greater love than the love of Jesus. Today, if you feel hopeless, he gives hope unconditionally. If you've been rejected, he accepts you completely. If your burdens weigh heavy, lay your fears and failures at the foot of the cross, for his blood has erased them entirely longer a slave, but an heir of salvation, you are his child, his chosen, you are his beloved.
the nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, they tell me how much you love me, the thorns in your brow, they tell me how you bore so much pain to love me. Tell me how much you love me. Thorns on your back, they tell me how you bore so much shame to love me. When the heavens fade away, all your scars they still remain. Forever they will say how much you love me. The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, they tell me how much you love me. The thorns on scars they still remain and forever they will say how much you love me and I want to say was an awesome song. And uh, let's give another round of applause to Tim and Jewel. Great job. You guys sound awesome. You ought to cut a CD. Of course, it's probably not a, they don't call them CDs anymore, right? That's just for old people, right? Obviously, when we think about the nails in his hands and his feet, when we think about his scars, uh, they to us are beautiful because they are signs that he proudly bore and that he still bears to say how much he loves us. I hope that you're here tonight because you love him, because he loves you in a fathomless way. And everything that he did was to show us how much he loved us. Praise be to God for that. We have been talking about Jesus' passion. And we saw his passion illustrated in his triumphal entry as he looked at Jerusalem and yet he wept over the people there because they did not, as he said, recognize the time of their visitation. We saw Jesus' passion as he sat down at the Last Supper and he told his disciples that he had eagerly desired to spend that time with them, that last meal together to help them understand through the elements what we're going to receive tonight, 
how his body would be broken and his blood would be shed. In this, we see his passion. We see his passion in the Garden of Gethsemane as he knelt down to pray. And as the Bible says that he sweat drops of blood, that blood that he sweat was for us. And the blood that he would shed on the cross was for us. That speaks of his passion. Hallelujah. It's interesting to me that the opening act of all of creation began in a garden, in Eden, where the first Adam sinned and turned away from God as death entered into the world. Thousands of years later, Jesus Christ, the last Adam, as the Bible describes, describes him, obeys and turns to God in the garden to accept the cup from his Father's hand. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 says this, So it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. Praise be to God. Although God's plan for salvation was designed before the creation of the world, we must never forget that its execution came at great cost. Ultimately, we are the ones responsible for the blood that dripped from our Savior's brow as he prayed in the garden. We are the cause of the blood that flowed from his body at the cross of Calvary. His blood was shed at great cost. Let us never forget that. I love what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. He says, We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. I don't think Paul is saying that he constantly remembers what Jesus did so that he feels too guilty about sinning in the future. I believe that Paul understood Christ's great sacrifice of love. And Paul carried around that knowledge in his heart. And he says here that while he carried that around in his heart, the life of Christ could then be revealed in his life. This is, this is really what our goal, what I would like for our goal together to be tonight. For us to understand better who Jesus is, what he was willing to do. Not just what he was willing to do for all of humanity, but what he was willing to do to do for you because it was your sin, it was my sin, it was our sin, but individually it was your sin that was put on him. As the Bible says, it's by his stripes that you're healed. And for that act to become so personal that we wouldn't live our lives and then just kind of forget about it, and then when we get back to Easter again, we remember it and we talk about it, and then we put it away. Because to be honest with you, to really fully see it with our hearts is a bit uncomfortable. It causes me, when I think about it, to want to look away. Because it's too much. He did too much. Let's take a look at what he did, and let's carry it with us and not forget it, so that his life his what did his life look like it looked like love and joy and peace and power that his life can be revealed in us as we remember what he did to purchase our salvation john 18 4 tells us that jesus being god certainly knew all that was going to happen to him he knew in painstaking detail the events that were to follow so Tonight, we're going to take a look at some of those events. And if you could give me grace, I would appreciate it, because I'm going to do a little more reading tonight than what I normally do. Um, but I want you to know, I'm not trying to show off in the delivery of this message. It's not about that. It's about simply understanding and rehearsing, not only with our minds, but with our hearts, what he was willing to do. So... Different Gospels give us different accounts, but when you put those accounts together, they, they're all true and they all intertwine. They back each other up and they fill in the gaps. So we'll take a look at the account of the Gospels tonight with regard to what Jesus suffered for us. And by the end, I hope that as Scripture washes over our hearts that we'll have a new revelation of who Jesus is and just 
how much he was willing to do for us. Let's pick up in the Garden of Gethsemane sometime after midnight. And we know that Judas arrives there accompanied by armed officers. And of course, Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. Jesus is arrested. And during this arrest, the disciples begin to fight back. The Bible says that Peter even draws his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus, right? And in the midst of all of that, okay, Jesus heals Malchus' ear. I wonder if there was anybody other than Jesus and Malchus who even knew that, right? And yet all of Jesus' disciples abandon him. They run away. They forsake him, which he had predicted and he knew that was going to happen. Jesus is taken captive. At approximately 2 a.m., the high priest questions Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching, and Jesus says nothing, like a lamb being led away to slaughter. He doesn't try to defend himself. This, of course, frustrates the high priest, and he demands that Christ confess whether or not he is the true Son of God. Matthew chapter 26, verse 64. Let's look at Christ's response. Jesus says, you have said so. But I say to all of you from now on, meaning hereafter, right? You're seeing me here now, but the next time that you're going to see me after this, after I go to the cross, hereafter, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Sounds good to us. (laughs) Not so good to the high priest. He tears his clothes in anger and cries out that Christ has committed blasphemy. The high priest then asks the council for a verdict to which they shout that the death penalty should be carried out. Jesus should be crucified. Meanwhile, Peter is outside, warming himself by the fire, trying to follow Christ from a distance, which none of us were meant to do. Just hours earlier, he had assured Jesus that he would never leave him, he'd never desert him, no matter what, and yet there, by that fire, he denies Christ three times before the rooster crows. Likely sometime between 5 and 6 a.m., because Jewish law demanded two sessions of the Sanhedrin to hear and to try a defendant, a second trial of Jesus was held. It was more of a formality, though, as his sentence had already been determined unanimously. At this point, Jesus is bound and sent to Pontius Pilate, the Roman prefect of Judea, for punishment. This happens around 6 a.m., At approximately 7 a.m., instead of blasphemy, what they accused him of at first, the Jewish leaders bring Jesus to Pontius Pilate under the charge of treason against Rome. His enemies want the Romans to carry out the punishment of legally murdering Jesus. So Pilate questions Jesus, and he discovers that he is from Galilee. Pilate then sends Jesus to Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee and son of Herod the Great for judgment. Herod questions him, but again receives no answer. Herod and his soldiers mock Jesus. They see themselves in a position of authority over him, and they despise him, and they put a robe on him. And then, after they're done mocking him, they send him back to Pilate. At roughly 8 a.m., Pontius Pilate tells the Jewish religious leaders that he and Herod Antipas find Jesus innocent. He says, what you're, what, you're, what you're accusing him of, we find no fault in him. I think it's interesting how God can even use sinners to prophesy about his son. Amen? We find no fault. Truly, there was no fault in him. Pilate wishes to release him. But the shouting of the crowds and the chief priests prevail. They say, give us Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a thief and a murderer who had led a rebellion. And yet they cried out for Barabbas, release us, give us Barabbas, crucify Jesus, crucify him. And the Bible says that their shouts prevailed. Pilate then has his soldiers scourge Jesus. 
The idea of scourging was in and of itself a heinous form of torture. Jesus would have been stripped. Then he would have been made to kneel against a two-foot high post. There he was shackled to a ring atop the post, putting him in a position where his movement was restricted. And he was whipped repeatedly, 39 times in fact, with a flagellum an instrument that would have contained 18 to 24 inch long leather strips that were laced either with bone or metal or both. You can imagine the impact that this whipping, this scourging would have not only on his skin but also on his flesh. These strips cut deeply into him causing horrific pain and damage. Keep in mind that he did this because he loved us. Isaiah 52, 14 says, Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Matthew 27, verses 27 through 31 tell us what happened after his scourging. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus to the praetorium. This was... Pilate's palace or headquarters or both, and gathered the whole company of soldiers somewhere between three and six hundred around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his clothes on him, and they led him away to crucify him. So this evening, uh, we have a, a, a makeshift crown of thorns up here. And this would have been similar to what Jesus wore. I'm not going to try it on for you tonight. I, I did try it on earlier today, however. And just setting it atop your head would be something that caused pain. Interestingly enough, I had pretty much a headache the whole day too, all right? And I was thinking about, I'm such a baby (laughs) when it comes to pain. I feel sorry for myself because it's like I have a migraine. What kind of headache this must have caused as it was placed atop Jesus' head. And then they hand him a staff as if he's a ruler But after they put that crown on him, then they begin to beat it and to beat him and to strike him. Not senselessly, because he was fully aware of everything that was happening to him. At some point, at the beginning of the crucifixion, they would have offered him uh, a wine mixed with myrrh. It it would have been to, to deaden the pain, but he wouldn't take it. Because he wanted to fully bear what was due each one of us. That's our Lord. Amen. That's our Savior. Hallelujah. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The soldiers take Jesus to Golgotha, also known as Calvary, and the place of the skull to be crucified. And along the route, they force Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross. At Golgotha, Jesus is laid on a cross beam, the one that he was forced to carry, the one that he was too exhausted to carry by himself. And there, five-inch nails are driven into his wrists. And the cross beam that he was nailed to was hoisted into position. And once in place, nails were pounded into his feet. Slowly, his lungs would begin to fill with fluid. Jesus would have had to push himself up in order to just draw a breath, his lacerated back grating against the rough beam of wood. It was likely around 9 a.m. when Jesus was crucified. And crucifixion was considered to be the most painful and torturous method of execution ever devised and was used on the most depraved and wicked human, uh, human beings. In fact, so horrific was the pain that a word was designed to help explain it excruciating, which literally means from the cross. 
I don't think I'm going to use that word anymore <laughs> to describe my pain. It was his pain that was excruciating. It was his pain that was from the cross. At his lowest of lows, during his most painful moments, straining just to breathe, Jesus offers this prayer. And he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't understand. Now, obviously, in a physical sense, they understood. He prayed that prayer over those who stood over him, over those who beat him, over those that nailed his hands to that beam. He prayed that prayer, but spiritually speaking, he understood the darkness that they were under and that they did not understand, spiritually speaking, what they were doing, that they were crucifying the Son of the living God. Father, forgive them. A second time, Jesus speaks and offers mercy from the cross to one of the two thieves who comes to faith in Christ as he is also being crucified there. And Jesus says to him, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Amen? Our Savior, even on the cross, he's not thinking about himself. When he speaks, he speaks of others. He speaks forgiveness. He speaks mercy. Hallelujah. The next time that we see Jesus speak, we, we see him share a concern about his earthly mother, Mary. And he says to Mary, Mary, woman, behold your son. He's speaking of John, one of his closest disciples. And from that time on, John would become like a son to Mary. And the Bible says that he would even invite her into his own home and care for her. Amen. Jesus' concern. His motivation to the cross was love. His motivation was for people, people there. His motivation was for us to save us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Pontius Pilate had the charge against him written in three languages, in Hebrew and Greek and in Latin, and it was put above the cross. And it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Oftentimes, the site of crucifixion was near a thoroughfare where many would be passing by and would be intimidated by the Roman cruelty that put them there. Thus, the reason for the writing in three languages, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Scripture tells us that from noon to 3 p.m., darkness covers the entire land. And at 3 p.m., Jesus Christ, the Savior of man, cries out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not long after that, Jesus says, I thirst. Made me wonder if he was talking about physically or spiritually or maybe even both. I thirst. I think about that verse that says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I think that Jesus was getting thirsty for the presence of the Father. He is offered wine vinegar, a sour drink mixed with gall to drink while on the cross. Then Roman soldiers cast lots for his clothes. Jesus cries out with a loud voice, it is finished. Because everything, everything that scripture had foretold, everything that must be done, every sin that had ever been committed had then been paid for. And Jesus speaks one last time, and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Praise be to God. At this point, the Jews desiring the death of those crucified before the high holy day starts around 6 p.m. that evening, they ask Pilate if the legs of those who are being crucified might be broken. Pilate agrees, and the legs of those crucified with Jesus are broken, but his are not because he is already dead. A soldier pierced Jesus' side with a spear to ensure that he was dead. The Bible says that blood and water flowed. Only blood would have flowed out if the body was alive. This indicates that his body was already dead. Pilate, just before sunset, allows Joseph of Arimathea a rich member of the Sanhedrin to take the body of Jesus 
Joseph and Nicodemus wrap his body in fine linen with a mixture of myrrh and aloes and bury him in the brand new tomb Joseph had made for himself. This certainly isn't the end of the story. And I would invite you to come back this Sunday. Right? I know you know the end. I just want us to be able to celebrate it together. And I want us to pause here tonight to think about what's been read, to think about what Jesus did, and to try to understand it more fully, to try to make it personal. The emotional weight and the physical suffering that Jesus endured are unimaginable. As I said before, it's hard not to look away. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you've put your faith in Christ, I want you to understand something tonight. I don't like it when we minimize the death and the sacrifice of Christ. Sometimes we do that when we don't recognize what he's done for us. When people say, well, I'm just a sinner, I want you to know you used to be one. But Jesus became sin so that you might become his righteousness. Now that doesn't make you perfect, it doesn't make you holier than thou, but what it does make you, according to Scripture, is his righteousness. You're his. He did something. And what he did on that cross, he wants it to be transmitted to us. Not just something that we know, but something that we live and we breathe and we eat and we sleep. And it's the thing that wakes us up in the morning and keeps us up at night. His name is Jesus. He wants that passion to be inside of each one of us. Thank you, Jesus, for becoming our sin that we might become your righteousness. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. It says, therefore... Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Do you ever wonder who those witnesses might be? Do you ever think about those witnesses? Whether it consists of the people that are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, our heroes of faith throughout the Bible. Or whether there are other more personal heroes of faith, like if you've had a loved one who you knew loved Jesus and you know they're in heaven waiting for you, if they might be among the cloud of witnesses. Listen, there's a great cloud of witnesses, okay? There's a great cloud. I don't know if they can see us now, hallelujah, but one day we'll all see one another. So since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. That Greek word entangles also means clings to us, okay? Sticks to us. Let's get rid of the sin. Let's get rid of the evil. Let's get rid of all of those things that can so easily stick to us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us run. Let's not give up. Let's not slow down. Let's not look back. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, see Jesus. He is the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. The Bible says this, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Sometimes it's good of Scripture after you read it to ask questions. It's a good way to have a conversation with the Holy Spirit and to get to know him a little bit better, right? And so I started thinking after reading this Scripture, what exactly is the Bible talking about when it talks about the joy that was set before Jesus? What is that? What is the joy? Maybe one of the joys would have been Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, right? That was something that he said to the high priest. He said, it is as you see it is, and hereafter you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father and coming in the glory in the clouds, right? 
That could have been part of the joy that was set before him. But I want you to know that I believe that there was, was a joy just as great that Jesus had. I want you to understand what his motivation was. I want you to understand the joy that was set before him. What allowed him to go, to go the distance? What allowed him to look at the, at the cross and the Bible says to scorn or despise its shame for the joy that was set before him? That joy, I believe, was to see us completely set free. His joy was to see the price be paid that we might be forgiven. To look at us and to see us not as sinners, but as righteousness. To look at us and to see us not with a death, a death sentence of condemnation hanging over our heads, but to see us free, completely free, blood bought, born again, sanctified, saved, made righteous. That was his joy. And that is why he despised the cross so much. I don't believe he despised the cross so much. Yes, it was, it was a, a form of torture and a place of agony. But listen, I believe that he despised that cross because every single one of us were destined for it. He took our suffering, he took our punishment, he took our pain, and by his wounds we're healed. He took it for us. He scorned the cross because at that place, that's where all of our sin was laid on him. That's what he scorned. He scorned the pain and the shame and the guilt and all of the garbage that would be placed on us because of sin, and he hated it, he despised it. He went to the cross and absorbed the total penalty, penalty of our sin. And in doing so, he transformed the cross. Anybody before, anybody before this time would have looked at you know, the cross and would have understood that that was a, a symbol of pain and torture and death. But now what do we do? We hang up crosses, we wear crosses, and what are they a symbol of? They're a symbol of his victory. Amen? Amen. Because of what he did. He didn't come to make that a symbol of his victory. He came to make you and I symbols of his victory. He came to make you and I righteous. Amen. Amen? That's what he came to do. That was the joy set before him. That's why he hated the cross, because that was the place where he would pay for all of our sin. And if he didn't, that would still be hanging over our heads. After I had finished the outline for tonight's message, I was just thinking about his suffering and meditating on it. And it's, it's something that, I don't know about you, but I can only do it for so long. It's like I have to take a break. Not a break from Jesus, but it's so how great the pain of searing loss, that act that caused the Father to turn his face away as the one who was righteous was made to be our sin that we might become his righteousness. And I just felt like, Lord, you know, I, I, just, I need to be with you and I need to, I need to be before you. you, you know, I know that you know what that feels like when there are times where you, do, you can't even pray sitting up or standing up that you just have to kneel down. And for some reason, I... You know, in talking to the Lord, I, I said to the Lord, I said, what was the worst part? And I don't know if I really expected to get an answer or not, but I, I was thinking about, you know, the scourging and the crown of thorns and being struck in the head and the piercing of the nails and, and, and being hung and the, the, the feeling of suffocation and the feeling of being rejected. But I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart 
And one of the things that I felt like he said to me was that the worst part was that I took on the shame of everyone's sin, but there are still so many who reject me. That's the worst part. It's like when you put all of yourself into something to do something for somebody that you love and they reject it and they don't want to have anything to do with it and everything for our salvation was paid for. He already did it and yet there are people that don't know. They either don't know or they don't care. But the problem is that those people still have a death sentence. They still have condemnation hanging over them. They still have guilt and shame and pain and embarrassment, all the things that he already died for. I felt like Jesus was saying, I love you. I hate the fact that the shame and the torture of the cross is what you deserve. That's why I despised it. So I took it for you. I took it so that I could offer you forgiveness and grace. So what should our response be tonight? Well, we talked about it at the beginning, 2 Corinthians 4.10. One of our responses should be, let us always carry around with us the knowledge of what Jesus did for us so that the life of Jesus might be revealed in us and through us. Let us understand in new measure, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that says, for by grace you have been saved, Right? By His grace, unmerited favor. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's not something you can do. Not by works so that anybody can boast. You're not going to earn salvation. All you can do is put your faith in Jesus and be made righteous by faith. Amen? Amen? Accept it, receive it, believe it. Psalm 97.10 says this. I believe that this also should be our response tonight. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. Let me say it again. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. For he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Romans 12, 9 says it like this. Love must be sincere Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Or be entangled in what is good. Amen? Amen. Jesus said there is but one that is good, that is God. Let your life be entangled with God. Listen, his love for us is sincere. It's completely sincere and he says if our love is to be sincere we can't say that we sincerely love him until we get to a place where we hate what is evil do you hate what is evil do you hate sin listen when you look at what he did he did for the sake of sin he did to forgive us that should help us to hate it to know that it cost our savior his life He was scourged and beaten, mocked and spit on, and all of these things that we deserve. That's what sin did to him. And for that reason, we should hate it. Not just when we think about Easter. But we should hate it when sin crouches at our door in temptation. And it tries to drag us into something that we think. And and obviously, sin brings pleasure to the flesh. But spiritually speaking, do we even know what we're doing? Sin costs Jesus' life. And if we're going to sincerely love him, if we're going to sincerely cling to him and let our lives be entangled in him, then we have to start hating the very thing that he died for. Amen? Let's hate it. Let's hate sin. Let's hate lust. Let's hate apathy. Let's, Let's hate lying and cheating and adultery and fornication. Let's hate those things because of what Jesus had to pay the price to forgive us of all of them. And we all sin and fall short of his glory. Amen. But may, may Jesus, may he look at our hearts and say, there's a people 
that are carrying around with them the knowledge of my death, that the life of my, my life might be revealed to them. There's a people who sincerely love me because they are learning to hate the very thing that I died for in order that they might cling to me. Amen? To have a passion for him. Do you have a passion for him? Because he has a passion for you. He didn't just do what he did to do it. He did it because he loves you. Amen? He did it because he loves you. You were the joy that was set before him. And if he had to, he'd do it again. But thanks be to God, he paid the price once and for all. It's by his grace that we are saved. It's by his mercy that we're saved. Amen? Let your love be sincere tonight. Heidi's going to sing a song for us about God's grace. You can certainly sing, sing with her, but if not, just meditate on the words of the song. thankful for his grace tonight. His grace can cover you too. Jesus is just a prayer away. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's by grace you're saved through faith. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. But Jesus died for it. Endured all that suffering for the joy set before him. The joy set before him was you and your salvation that he could give it to you without cost. To you, it cost him. It cost his body. Would you go ahead and open up the bread tonight? It cost his body. Oh, it cost.
cost him so much that his body was torn and broken and crushed because he loved us. Lord, we thank you for your broken body tonight. We pray, Lord God, that our bodies too would be laid down before you that you might have your way in us. Forgive us of all of our sin, we pray. Help us to hate sin because of what it cost you. May your life be revealed in our bodies. In Jesus' name, would you take and eat the bread? You can go ahead and peel back that foil. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this cup tonight. We thank you for the cup that you were willing to drink out of obedience to the Father to go all the way to the cross for our sin. Thank you for your blood that flowed freely for us, your blood that covers us, your blood that forgives us. We will not take your blood for granted. Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your cleansing sacrifice. Let's take and drink. Thank you, Jesus. Would you please stand with me tonight? I would love for us to um, close out our evening in a time of worship together.
Lord, truly tonight we owe everything to you. We stand in awe of who you are and the price that you were willing to pay. Lord, we pray that you would help us to always carry around in our hearts what you were willing to do for us. Lord, that your life might be revealed in us and through us. Lord, I pray that you would teach us day by day to hate what is evil, to hate what it costs you, and to cling to you, God, with everything that we are. Lord, thank you. I thank you tonight that you love us enough to consider us to be your joy. And Lord, you, you are our joy. You are our crown. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise and we give you our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Feel free to stick around and to fellowship and to worship. Uh, if, you need, if you need prayer of any sort, please come up to the altar. We'd love to pray with you tonight. We're looking forward to celebrating his resurrection in just a couple days. We'll see you Easter Sunday. Amen. <laughs>